And good morning, y'all. I'm uh, up and running and ready to go. Had to kind of check on something real quick there. <laughs> it interrupted me in the middle of a statement. But uh, that's cool. Just doing the little pre-roll thing before we go actually live. Give the uh, notifications a chance to go out. And uh, make sure everybody can get a notification. And also waiting on the clock in the other room to finish its little bong 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 routine. It's 12 noon here on the west coast of the U.S., so, of course, I have to pick the point of the day where the clock has to bong 12 times instead of just one. But, hey, such is life. And it sounds like I'm ready now. So, I'll say, morning, y'all. How's everybody doing today? Welcome to live Q&A number 40. Gemini, 40. <sighs> Who'd have thought it? Uh, we'll be talking today about uh, ramps and leads like I uh, talked about in this morning's video. That was by request from a few weeks back. And um, I'll address it here in just a minute. First, need to go down the list and do a little roll call here. We have Ice Cream 62 coming to us from Italy, how are you doing? Good evening for you. It's straight up noon for me here. So you're eh, about seven, maybe eight in the evening there, getting ready to close it down for the night. Uh, we got Steve Nealon, Harneal Media, sponsor of MarkLindsayCNC.com, which I need to go over and update, and I haven't in the past few weeks. Be patient with me, y'all. There's a lot going on behind the scenes. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Uh, if you're looking for a website, looking for a web store, want to set up merch, something like that, talk to Steve at Harnell Media. He will hook you right up. Uh, we got Chris Potts checking in from the UK. It's evening time for you. Troy Pritchard, Mr. Stephen Maine, early Monday morning, uh, talking to us from the future. Dave Kraus, Joseph Rozak, Wayne Hurl, Dave Matthews. Yes, you made it on time this week. And let's see who else we got here. Keith Stanford, Don. Keep it simple. All right, Don. Ah, Francisco Paz from Rio de Janeiro. And Gary Hammett, how are you doing today? Kevin Ells from South Africa. Man, that is... That is still, to me, that is still so wild that I could be talking to somebody in the UK, in Italy, in South Africa, in Rio de Janeiro. Man, it's still some, like some kind of voodoo to me. Uh, let's see, my views. Yes, I said bong. Jim Pell, MDR in South Carolina. Dennis Cook, Charles Lawrence there in Denver. David Crook over there in North Carolina. Uh, Jack Painter, Tim Townsend, Jim Hester, Dale Francis. Boy, we got a bunch going on here. Ronald Ledger, Steve Late, Bobby Orr, all the way from Grants Pass. That's about 30 miles up the road from me. Not even that, 25 miles. What is it, Bobby? About 25 miles. I'm just outside of Medford. Uh, let's see. Uh, Richard Poulin from Quebec. Boy, and uh, Sergio Quintino, and I know I just butchered that name. <sighs> Welcome aboard, y'all, and thanks for joining me. Thanks for spending part of your Sunday. And oh, Landis Stutes is with us today. Landis, I'm going to narrow cast for uh, just a little bit here. I got an email. Was that you that sent me that email? talking about a file and this, that, and the other. I want to make sure it's you before I open it up. I don't like to open up stuff that are unpleasant surprises. Just want to make sure it was really you. And Jose Rodriguez, also from Brazil, but this from Sao Paulo. Cool. Uh, Dave Dietrich and Dennis Cook, sitting on a boat 
sitting on the boat in Lake... I okay, now you're just rubbing it in, Dennis. Times is hard, huh? Sitting on the boat in Lake Erie. Yeah. Okay. Times is hard. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, what I wanted to address about this morning's video was... This was an introductory video. I kind of left a few things out of it because I didn't want to create any confusion. I edited it out, but there were several times during that video when I was recording it, thinking, Mark, you just confused yourself. Do you even know what the heck is going on here? I plan on doing a follow-up video to this one. It won't be next week. It'll be down the road a little bit. But there are some ways of combining ramps and leads that I didn't go through. I just didn't want to confuse it. So I figured the best way to do it was to show what a ramp was and when you would use it. Show what a lead was and how to use that. Because you kind of need to know how to do them both separately before you start combining them. So that's just my opinion. I wanted to go ahead and get that done, get that out of the way. So now you know how each one of them kind of work. Also, if you integrate ramps, especially with that separate last pass function in the profile tool path, it will basically completely eliminate any dwell marks uh, the little trails between different pass depths, it'll eliminate those and you'll end up with a nice, clean, clean cut. Now, I did a video a couple of years back. I believe it was part five of the uh, Absolute Beginner series that detailed how to use the separate last pass. But in this follow-up video that I'm going to do in a couple of weeks... I will go back over it because that video was done in VCAR version 8 and some of the controls have changed, some of the options have changed. So I figure an updated version of how to use the separate last pass in the newer versions of the software would probably be a good thing. So the follow-up video, the one came out today, will incorporate a separate last pass and show a few more options as far as integrating ramps and leads together. Um, now, as I said before in the video, I don't use leads very often at all. In fact, I've only used them a couple of times, uh, mainly because they are so slow. They do add a lot of time uh, to the machining operations because not only do you have your regular vector, but you have the extra leads, both lead in and lead out, and that rapid move. Because the bit will lift up out of the material and move over rapid and then drop back down. So you're basically just cutting one path one at one pass depth, lifting out, starting over, and cutting the next one. Lift out, start over, and cut the next one. And that just adds to machine time. Um I don't like to use leads all that often, but um, if you're cutting something like melamine or um, anything with a delicate surface that can be chipped out, a, uh, a lead with the compression bit, getting that bit plunged down below that upcut portion will help eliminate a bunch of chip out on that top surface. So, you know, um, it does add to machining time, but I don't know if you've ever priced anything uh, at a custom cabinet shop that's made out of melamine. You pay a premium for it. I mean, it's a pain to work with. You know, I remember the cabinet shop that I was working at, we charge extra for melamine because the tooling to cut it was expensive. <laughs> and this was back in the 80s and 90s, so. Okay, let's see. Do we have any questions out there? Um, let's see. Woody Wan says, first timer, good to be here. Thanks for all the help. Thank you for all your support. I really appreciate it. Um, let's 
see ah, Rockin' Woodworks, Mr. Eloy Escajedo from beautiful Miami, Florida, my partner in crime on the Trampled Underfoot podcast. We have an excellent time doing that podcast Tuesdays here on YouTube at 9.30 Eastern Time, 6.30 per, uh, Central Pacific Time. Get it together, Mark. It's almost like you've been doing this for a week or two. 9.30 Eastern, 6.30 Pacific, Tuesday nights here on YouTube on the uh, Trampled Underfoot podcast YouTube channel. And it's a weekly podcast that we put out on, oh boy, um, Apple Podcast, iTunes, uh, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, you name it. If you can find the Trampled Underfoot podcast uh, out there, find it. You'll like it. We have fun. Anyway, let's see. Do I have any questions? Uh, bum, 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 bum. I'm not seeing any questions at all. So it looks like I, you know, um, answered everything. So that's cool. Um, okay, Landis did answer me. Yes, it was me, but I went back and watched several of your 3D videos and was able to fix the problem. Well, glad to be of service. Sorry it took so long. <laughs> so, let's see. Um, let's, let's see. F Dennis Cook, first time for me, and your videos really helped me out. I have experience writing G-Code with conversational programming, but I'm lost ball high in the weeds with VCarve. If you can sit down and write G-code with like conversational cam or something like that, then VCarve is... VCarve is going to be like putting training wheels back on your bicycle. I'm not kidding you. If you... I. I Mad respect to you guys who can sit down and write out G-code. I am not that person, believe me. I know what a... I don't even really know how to read G-code. I know what a few things are, but um, not very many at all. So, okay, let's see. Uh, Jim Pell says, Mark, clarify the cause of dwell marks and trail marks. The best way to test for this. Well, the best way to test for this is to look at the piece. You either, you either see them or you don't. And if you don't see them, you're doing it right. If you do see them, the causes could be anything from um, bit deflection. Maybe you're plunging a little bit too hard. And this is especially true with thinner diameter bits. If you're getting dwell marks with like an eighth inch diameter bit or um, see for the metric folks, that would be three millimeter. If you're getting dwell marks with a small bit like that, you're probably plunging just a little bit too fast and it's causing that bit to just bend just slightly. I mean, not enough to be visible, but it's only got to bend two or three thousandths of an inch for it to make that mark. Or maybe it's a little bit of flex. You're putting a lot of pressure down. It's a little bit of flex up at the router, the router mount, or even your gantry cross piece. But basically a dwell mark is where the bit is not plunging in absolutely 100% perfectly straight. And routers of all, and we're talking CNC routers here, of all qualities will do this. You can get dwell marks on CNC routers that have six-digit price tags. It's just that impact when you're going from a spinning bit, in, spinning in the air, to touching that piece of material, it's a jolt, no matter how gentle it is. But when you plunge that bit down a sixteenth or an eighth of an inch into the material, it's, there's going to be some give there. So it's almost impossible to completely eliminate. But ramping it in lowers that bit on a more gentle slope. And the bit's able to cut away the material rather than just try to plunge down into it, you know. I don't know if that makes sense or not. But the the way to test for it is... 
just look. If if you see it, it's there. If you don't see it, you're doing it right. Also keep in mind that you're going to be doing some sanding on these edges anyway, probably. I mean, I I have yet to find a machine that will at, le at least to my standards, I've yet to find a machine that will uh, run apart to be absolutely finish ready when you first take it off of the machine. I mean, every part I've ever run has needed a little bit of sanding, at least to be to my standards anyway. Uh, let's see. Uh, Linda Lindsay says, you haven't said when you're going to take out the trash. I don't know where you've been because it went out two days ago. But thank you. Um, <laughs> that's my better half, by the way. Thank you for uh, your support. Bob Hilt Bridal, poster of all things rude, crude, socially unacceptable, also known as funny, uh, would do a separate last pass with a ramp help with a witness mark. Yes. And in fact, uh, you must have... Uh, you must have uh, joined a little late because I will be doing a follow-up video to this video in a couple of weeks. It won't be next week's video. Um, this video was the introductory video to ramps and leads. And there are more options. There are more settings that you can use. But I didn't want to confuse matters. And as it was, it was a 40-minute video. Might as well have been. So I kind of cut it short. And in the next follow-up video, I will show you some other ways to combine leads with ramps. And uh, also incorporate the separate last pass, which will totally eliminate all of the dwell marks. As well as the little witness mark trails that you're seeing as you know it cuts each uh, pass depth. So, yes, that's that's coming. Um, let's see, Jim Hester, when you use a final pass along with ramping, how much allowance do you use for the last pass? I usually use 10 thousandths, so that's 0 0.01 is my allowance for a separate last pass. That's just enough to where it will... That's just enough to where it will remove all those trails and any dwell marks but it's not so much that the bit can't cut the entire thickness of material in one pass. Because effectively, that's what you're doing with a separate last pass. You're cutting the full thickness of the material in one go. But you're only removing ten thousandths of an inch, so it's not, it's not that much. So... Let's see, Lane Byron, your videos are really helpful. Thank you, Mark. Well, thank you very much, Lane. I do appreciate it. Um, oh, Richard Poulin says, your explanations are always well presented, so not many questions after that. Okay, but I tell you what, after that video, I will change the way I work to protect my machine. Well, it's not so much protecting your machine as it is, I mean, all mechanical devices wear, and that's just all there is to it, but it, it just lessens the impact. Because a, a gentle motion is always going to be less jarring than a sudden motion. And, you know, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction where you keep plunging a bit and eventually things are going to loosen up and things are going to wear. I mean, it's an impact. And while it doesn't seem like much, bits are cheap. It's also jarring to the bearings in the router or spindle. It's also jarring to your, your z-axis linear the the your linear rails and bearings or uh, ball screws and everything else. So if you can make it gentler on the machine, why wouldn't you? And it only takes a few seconds. I mean, it adding a ramp uh, even if your plunge rate is half of your feed rate, the ramps are generally speaking not long enough to really add that much time, maybe a couple of seconds. I, I think in my longest carve that I've used ramps on, and I generally just use ramps on pockets and profiles, um, maybe it added 15 seconds of machine time. So negligible, not enough to really worry about. 
So let's see. Charles. Love your videos. Charles Brown. I love your videos. Which video should I watch to convert closed vectors to 3D? I am just getting into 3D modeling, so I don't have any 3D modeling videos out other than I did a couple of videos on using a two-rail sweep. And I'll put a link to the two-rail sweep videos. Let me write it down. And uh, I'll put a link to those two rail sweep videos down in the description of this video as soon as I go off the air here. But um, I'm just getting into it myself. And until I get better at it, I don't feel comfortable making a video on it. Because I have a major philosophical problem with presuming to teach somebody something I don't know how to do myself. There's too much of that out there and I don't want to add to it. So, but I will get to it. Okay, let's see. Mr. Matt, awesome wood things hoss in the house. How you doing today, Matt? Let's see. Woody Wan says, I do have a question. Why would importing text or text converted to curves from Corel do the letters become nothing but a massive amount of nodes? Fix them based on your appearance. Okay. The reason is because every vector program handles, th handles things differently. A lot of vector graphics programs don't use Bezier curves or arcs unless you tell the program to convert to Bezier curves or arcs. More often than not, they're using a bunch of short li straight line segments. And they just load up like, uh, imagine the center of the letter O. They'll just load that up with a whole bunch of segments of straight lines. And just pack the, the nodes or points in there. So that it looks round to you. So about the only way to get in there and clean that up is to convert it to curves. Now, I've imported perfect circles out of AutoCAD that were drawn up on a DXF file in AutoCAD, and it's a perfect circle. And there'll be 24, 36 nodes in it, when a perfect circle only needs four. So it, it just depends on the program you're importing from. Some are better at handling that than others. Um, I don't use Corel Draw, but, or any of the, well, the only Corel program I use is my video editing program, and I use Paint Shop Pro, but I do basically all of my design work in uh, Aspire now, before that in VCarve. I mean, I even drew up my little mustache and sunglasses logo. I drew that in VCarve, that imported it into Corel Draw and backfilled all the colors. It's just easier for me to use. But the only way really to clean all that up and get rid of all of those nodes is to convert it to curves as you're doing. And, uh, you know, other than that, I, I really don't uh, know what else to say unless there is a way in the Corel program to convert that all to either Bezier curves or arcs. Then I don't know what, otherwise uh, what to say. So let's see, um, keep going here, uh, Kent Mays, do you know if I can upgrade from Pro 9.5 to 10 and get the cribbage board holes layout? I get tired of element every six, okay, um, what you might do if, if, okay, if you're using, um, I guess you're using VCarve Pro 9.5. Go to the Vectric website, and if you don't already have one, create a V and Company account. And when you do that, go look for the clip art downloads. You may have those already available to you and just don't know it. I, I'm not sure because you're using 9.5. Um, 
I'm not a Vectric employee. I'm not a Vectric insider. I don't know anything more than anybody else does. But I do know that when they announced the Vectric user group meeting in San, uh, San Diego coming up this September, knock on wood, they did let slip one of the things they were going to be talking about was the features available in version 10.5. Now, I don't know if that means version 10.5 is coming between now and then, or if it's going to be released after um, September. But if you're thinking about upgrading from 9.5 to 10, just me talking, I would wait for 10.5 to come out. That way, it, because you get free upgrades for 12 months. If you, if you wait and purchase the upgrade after 10.5 comes out, you have 12 months from that date. So if version 11 comes out within 12 months, you're, you're covered. I don't anticipate that happening, but then again, I don't know any more than anybody else does. So just me talking here, if it were me, this is May. If you can hang out until 10.5 comes out, then I would pull the trigger on the upgrade. So, you know, just me. Oh, let's see. But I, but definitely can't, what I would do is I would go to the Vectric website if you have a VN Company account, look in the Clipart downloads because you may already have those available to you. If you don't have a VN Company account, start one. And then go look. They'll match up your license number and everything. Um, go look and see about the um, uh, um, Clipart downloads. So, uh, let's see... Dennis Cook, what would cause a Z-axis not to respond when I try to manly lower my Z0? This only seems to happen on one problem I'm trying to cut. I ran it in a Spire on a different machine, and it came out perfect on the first try, but in VCar Pro on another machine, I'm having problems with the Z-axis. I think the problem is in the tool data. The Z will only go into the wood 60 thousandths, and I need it to go 125. Okay, um, there are probably a hundred different variables it could be. In my experience, it's always check the mechanical first. I would calibrate the Z-axis and make sure that when you're telling it to plunge an eighth of an inch, it's actually plunging an eighth of an inch. Second, I would make sure you've got the uh, correct post-processor. And um, after that, would have to go back and troubleshoot. If you think it's in the tool data, uh, go back into the tool data and double and triple check all of your uh, settings um, to include the pass depth. If you need to change the pass depth, go for it. But. Holy cow, you are an expert, Mark. You pronounced Bezier correctly. I even say piezo correctly. Don't try this at home. I'm a trained professional. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> Alan Shrivner, I tend to get uglies around tabs. Can you ramp them, or is there anything to consider with them? Um... um when you say uglies around tabs... First, are you using 3D tabs or just regular tabs? I tend to use 3D tabs for two reasons. Number one, it makes a cleaner cut. Number two, it takes a little bit less time. Now, I know I just said something about 15 seconds on ramping, not being much time, and this will only save you two or three seconds. But on a 3D tab, they're pyramid shaped. They got an uh, entry angle and a lead out angle. The axis will come along, get to the area where it's supposed to tab, and the Z will just raise up and drop back down. It doesn't even slow down. So I tend to use 3D tabs, and that makes for a little bit smoother cut. Now, if you combine that with a 
the 3D tabs with a separate last pass, it'll move in that allowance and cut that entire thing out to include that 3D tab, make it a lot cleaner, a lot smoother. Um, the standard tabs where your bit moves over, lifts up, comes back down, and then keeps cutting, you can get dwell marks there too. So, um, yeah, 3D tabs will help. And then the, um, the uh, separate last pass will help also. And in fact, you know, you guys have just made up my mind. I'm going to go ahead and try to get that follow-up to the ramps and leads to incorporate the um, separate last pass and 3D tabs. So I'll go ahead and I'll do that next week. So that takes that out. So, okay. So let's see. Um, Dennis Cook said, forgot to mention I'm doing the Ten Commandments in Old English. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I would start with the mechanical and work your way backwards. I mean, that's about all you can do. If it's working fine on another machine, it's probably not the file. If so, it's, it's probably something within that machine. I would start by, um, I would start by calibrating the Z axis. So let's see. Charles Brown, is it possible to download your videos so that I can watch them on my tablet when traveling? Um, if you're not going to have an internet connection while you're traveling, the only way that I know of to legally do it, so I still get credit for the view, <laughs> is to uh, join YouTube TV and you can then download the videos to watch them and legally and I still get credit for the views and everything is cool. Now it used to be called YouTube Premium but not anymore or YouTube Red. No, excuse me, I'm wrong. Join YouTube Premium, not YouTube TV. It used to be called YouTube Red, now it's YouTube Premium. And uh, then you can um, download the videos and watch them at your leisure. So. Let's see, David Dietrich, Corel usually has lots of duplicate vectors. First thing I do is select everything, then edit, selection, duplicate vectors, then delete duplicates, then convert everything to curves. Works well. Thank you for that, David Dietrich. Um, that is something that I don't stress a lot, but it is a valid point. A lot of times... When you're importing vectors from, that were designed in another program, you can get a lot of duplicates, especially if that was a 3D DXF file. Meaning, for instance, you say you have a, uh, a flat plate that's a quarter inch thick that has hole drills in it, holes drilled in it. Even though it's a DXF file, it has the vectors for the top of that plate and the bottom of that plate, as well as the thickness of those holes. So you're likely to find a lot of duplicate vectors. I thank you for bringing that up, David Dietrich. Do check for duplicates when you're importing DXF files or any kind of file from another program. Let's see. Michael Bell, check and make sure your spindle is low enough for your shortest bit to go slightly lower than the top of your spoil board. Valid point. Valid point. Okay, Scotty, 476. Hi, Mark. I'm just starting out and designed a simple project, just cutting out quarter-inch plywood. I designed Infusion and imported to V-Carve as a DWG, but it has a ton of open or overlapping vectors in my fillets. Any idea why? Yes. Uh, what I just explained. Some programs handle curves especially different. Um, you can take those vectors, look for duplicates, basically select the whole vector, the whole thing, right click, and then, in fact, instead of telling you, let me go ahead and screen share. I'll do it here in Aspire. 
and go into my 2D view, make sure I am sharing, I am. And all you'll do is select all of the vectors, then right click, go to selection, select all duplicate vectors. If you have no duplicate vectors, you're pretty safe. Click OK. If you do have duplicate vectors, they will be selected out here in pink like such. Duplicates, I just delete. But you'll need to get in there and make sure. So, for instance, I'll go ahead and I'll select that, hold down Control, tap C, then tap V. So I just created a copy right on top of that. So I have a duplicate vector. Right click, select all duplicate vectors, and you can see it's highlighted in pink. I can just delete, and I haven't changed anything. Everything is fine. So, yeah, just right click, select all open vectors, no open vectors, select all duplicate vectors, no duplicate vectors, it's good. Now, when you get those overlapping vectors, you have a whole bunch of open vectors. What you can do is you can select them. I'll have to go back over to my drawing tab and come over here to join open vectors. If you leave your tolerance down pretty low, you can join as many as you can. If that still doesn't join them all, what you can do is you can put your cursor up here and click and eliminate one of the zeros and see if that changes either of your readouts here. I generally don't like to go more than 40 thousands. I generally prefer to leave it at least 40 thousands. If that still doesn't join them for you, Depending upon the vectors, you'll have to get in an experiment. You can select and then come over here. You have these three buttons. Join closed vectors with a straight line. Join closed vectors with a smooth curve. Or join closed vectors by moving the endpoints to a common point. I will put a list. I believe I have a video on these. I'll look. If I do, I'll put it in the uh, description box below. If not, I'll do a video on these three here. But I believe I already have a video on them. So give me about 10 minutes after we go off the air here. Then I will uh, get that video posted up. So, if that's any... Let's see, if that's about it... Uh, let's see, Lane Byron. Hi, Mark. Do you have a video on using fixture boards to batch machine large quantities of hardwood parts? No, I do not. I have been going to do a uh, couple of videos on fixtures. I just haven't gotten there yet. And to be honest, I don't use that many fixtures. Um, they're fairly straightforward to make, but... Um, the only one I really use is I just use a, I, I use one straight edge guide to help me kind of align up, uh, my parts on the spoil board. And I did do a video on that, but it's pretty simple. It's just nothing more than a straight edge that clamps into my uh, T-Track. I'll put a link to that in the uh, description to see. And, but they're all more or less the same. I mean, you can use any kind of like toggle clamps and whatever to hold your parts down, like when you're engraving on something. But um, I just don't use that many fixtures. So without having a need for one, you know. So let's see. Um, I think this is going to be our... Um, our last question for today. Boy, I've already been on for almost 40 minutes here, uh, from Ed Garcia. I was wondering if you had a recommendation on a bit for cutting melamine. 
Um, about the best I can say is um, I'm a firm believer in Amana tools. I would go look at Amana's compression bits um, at the Tools Today website and see what they have. Now, Amana bits tend to be a little pricey, but you get what you pay for. And I would rather spend double on a bit than replace a bunch of material or throw a bunch of uh, uh, throw a bunch of projects out. Um, so I would look and do some comparison at the Tools Today website. I think it's toolstoday.com. But if you look up uh, a mana compression bit, you'll probably find more links than you'll ever want. Um, so I don't have a specific recommendation for a bit, but um, a mana at Tools Today is my go-to place when I'm looking for something. So, okay. I think we're going to go ahead and wrap this up. Uh, next week will be a follow-up to this week's video. We'll get into more options with uh, leads and ramps. And I'll incorporate some 3D tab and uh, separate last pass. And get some good clean cuts going uh, without a bunch of witness marks, without a bunch of dwell marks. And help you guys... Uh, sand as little as possible because as much as I you know I, I tell people I don't mind sanding doesn't mean I love it so you know if I can reduce the amount of sanding I have to do I'm a happy guy so I'm gonna go ahead and call that good thank you everybody for uh, hanging with us uh, thank you for spending part of your Sunday with me. I hope some of you will join Eloy and my, um, ah, man, I got distracted. Shiny. I hope you all will join Eloy and I for the Trampled Underfoot podcast this Tuesday night, 930 Eastern, 630 Pacific. Just go to YouTube, look for Trampled Underfoot podcast that's us we're the only one like us so that must be us thank you very much for spending part of your sunday with me now get up go outside and go do something cool make some chips have a good one y'all y'all take care <laughs>